people, it would always be, you know, you would get together and rehearse for a gig. You know, someone said, you want to get together? And so we got a gig, we would rehearse. But with Lenny's thing and all these students, the sessioning among players was as important as your daily practicing. I have had such a good time getting to know today's guest. I really appreciate his perspective on the music world and improving and developing your own language. It's just very cool conversation that we've got for you today. I'm Jason Heath. This is Contrabass Conversations, and we are talking today with Don Messina, who has been a proponent of the music of Lenny Tristano ever since he first met him in 1973. Don also spent 14 years studying jazz with tenor saxophonist Fred Amend. We talk about them and much more, Sal Mosca, Jimmy Halpern, and so many other influences and people that Don has worked with over the years. We also dig into Don's decision to play gut strings without an amp and the consequences, maybe that's the wrong word, but the the what that leads you to experience musically and on gigs, just how the jazz scene has evolved. So many great topics. Really going to enjoy this conversation. And we're also going to feature a couple of excerpts from Don's solo album, Dedicated To. Quick shout out to our sponsors, D'Addario Strings, Steve Swan, String Bass, Upton Bass, Colstein Music, Modacity, and Coda, A440 Violin Shop, and The Bass Violin Shop. More on them later. And here we go with today's conversation with Don Messina. You know, it's kind of liberating in a way to just say no pickup, right? And to just, you know, be, be I guess, limited. But in a way, did you just making a decision to, uh, you know, play with a certain type of in a certain root type of room with a certain type of group? And yeah, it's uh, it, it takes away a whole host of issues that bass players struggle with. Right, but it's also limiting. Like I, 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 um, I couldn't perform with a group that was louder. I, I might now work be able to do a big band unless they had um they had a mic uh or, or a good sound system i do mm. mic my bass which i found you know just through a small you know 12 or 15 inch speaker uh with a shore 57 mm -hmm. it works for you know i usually play in trios or quartets maybe a quintet so piano bass drums if it's that situation and if i get the right drummer and i had i had one for uh, uh, over 30 years who really knew how to build Chad and who really knew how to play uh, with the bass. He, um, I really didn't need one. And uh, so sometimes you even have the right group, but it's a big sounding room. So yeah. Uh, so that's when I will mic it, but, yeah. or occasionally they will, uh, um, if there's a sound system there, that'll work. But I haven't used I haven't used a pickup in probably since probably early uh, since 2000 since I went to Gut Strings, and uh, I know Bill Merchant, uh, I think in 2015 overhauled my bass, uh, put a much bigger bridge in. My bridge was small uh, for, and he put it. He did his pay, gave me a new bass bar, which really made a difference. He he seems to specialize in that. It was beautiful, and it really you know. So the action's up high. Um, sometimes I feel, uh, I can tell when it's too high. I feel it immediately in my arm, and and I mm -hmm. and and it just seems like you know now I'm just being silly. You know, like why, uh, you know. <laughs> Uh, but it isn't, I remember reading, you know, it's not a macho thing that some people think, you know, digging in with the gut strings. For me, I personally just think it's a sound. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's it's the sound, and you have to give up some speed. But, at, you know, I also feel at this age, fine. 
you know, uh, I played right. enough notes. <laughs> you know, right. I, uh, uh, I played more than my share of notes uh, uh, for the world. I think it's better. Uh, but, you know, you could still do, I mean, it's amazing how much you could do. And, and when you listen to, you know, Paul Chambers was really playing. Oscar was really playing. Jimmy Bland was Red Mitchell, Scott LaFarre. I mean, I, I didn't, I don't hear any of them giving up something for it. Um, but I know that a lot of people said as soon as metal strings came, a lot of them just got rid of them in a second. <laughs> mm-hmm. So uh, mm-hmm. uh, they're expensive. They're expensive and they're temper. They can be very temperamental, especially like, like, and again, like moving out here to the West coast where it's, it's like the land of easiness, you know, like base maintenance, like nobody knows what a winter post is out here. You know, what, what are you talking about? Um, but you do in New York and lots of areas of, of the, the world. So I, and I know gut strings can be, uh, can be a little bit, uh, fussy is, have you had, have you had issues? Uh, you know, I've actually, I've been lucky. I, I've had so- I when the strings are good, you know. Occasionally, I've had I've had a couple of, of of the strings where there was something wrong with them, and I had to get them replaced. And but when the strings, like the ones I have on now, they're uh, they're sixteen months. The intonation is is very good. The the volume is good. There's no fraying. There's no un, un, uh, unwinding on the on the on the wound string, so I'm you know and I found that they go in within a day or two I can get them to pitch, and stay there. Mm. Now when the weather changes, you know they uh, um, uh, you might have to tune a little more, but I can't tell how much is that. I'm notorious uh, my own mind for n- just messing with it too much like, i'll get the i'll get the strings the height i want i mean i always wanted to ask i was always too embarrassed to ask some other other bass players is it just me or is everybody else doing this i'll get the adjustment just where i want it's oh this feels great but what happens if i just go up a little bit higher or a little bit lower or if i just move and then i just and then i just lose it you know and i just have this a uh, beautiful feel, and I keep thinking, but I'm always messing with my bridge to uh, Bill's. Uh, say, leave it, leave it. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'm always messing with the adjusters, uh, um, and I, I just uh, so every time you turn them, you know, you you uh, you affect the uh, the tuning. So so, but I but I think these strings, the corda, are very good. I uh, within a few days I. I mean, I know I could put them on and I could play with somebody immediately. It, mm-hmm. it, um, they would stay that much in tune. You know, next morning they would be dramatically out. But they, they, they would stay in tune and, and, and they, um, uh, they feel really good. Uh, you know, I, I, there's this um, oil that, they, that I get from them that I use. Uh, they do have, they, they seem to definitely have some wear on the fingerboard. Oh, you know? okay. Interesting. Yeah. yeah. I, I'm thinking, my God, it looks like another tunnel, uh, <laughs> uh, you know? And so that definitely happens. I was surprised. I would have thought that would have happened more with the metal strings, but my, my fingerboard is, uh, my, we got a new fingerboard part of my, uh, when I renovate, had the base overhauled in, uh, 2015. And, they're they're definitely uh, you know he's had to plane it uh, uh, a few times uh, due to the gut strings. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, I, you know, I've I've only limited experience uh, playing around, but I've been fascinated by these gut strings by a maker named uh, uh, I think Garrett is it Garrett Gensler. Gensler is definitely the last name. I don't I don't know if you've ever checked out these strings or know anything. Okay, well they're they're uh, they're not cheap. Uh, I guess no gut strings are, but he he custom makes. Uh, the set for you. You have to have a conversation with him about what you do and what you play. And then he, he's based in Germany. He makes these strings. And I have heard people in the classical world. I've heard jazz players. I've heard a few, not a lot. I don't know a lot of people with these strings, but they are remarkable. And they, they seem to last for a really long time, like several years. Um, They're kind of like the, the, yeah. Anyway, I wasn't sure if you'd, if you'd, uh, 
Yeah, they're 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 wild. They they sound they sound they have a sound that is just uh, so unlike steel. And um, people that use them swear by them. I've I've yet to try them. Just wondering. <laughs> oh, oh no, I'm gonna have to look into that. Maybe uh, in an email you can send me his name. I'll I'll uh, send I'll I will for yeah. sure. Yeah. One of these days I'm going to, I'm going to get those, get, I'm going to have a chat with him and, and get some of those strings because they, I heard a, a bass competition two years ago, I think. And the final four people, it was this international competition. It was in Dallas. And one of the four was playing those strings and his sound was so unlike everybody else's. And it's just this like projection. And I, I mean, it just really, really, uh, yeah, got, got me thinking a lot about him. Yeah. You know, I, I I remember when I first switched to them. You know, everybody saying it was going to do all this horrible stuff to the bass. It was going <laughs> to, um, you know, it just read all these things. Everybody saying, "Don't do it, don't do it." But I I didn't have that experience at all. You know, it 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 does make some grooves in the fingerboard that you know maybe a year every two years I have to get it planed or uh, uh, or sanded whatever Bill does, and I you know it is. You know, I got the new bass bar in, which is definitely more support underneath the bridge. I don't see the bridge warping. Uh, I don't, um, um, you know, it's been so long since I've seen, I've used metal strings. Though I had, a, when I had the bass repaired, I had to, uh, you know, he gave me a plywood bass that had metal strings on. And so before I switched strings, I said, oh, let me try playing this. It felt like I was, it was like that angel thin, uh, I forgot the spaghetti, you know, like it was like, <laughs> whatever that's called. <laughs> yeah, I sure. Said, wow. Yeah, I said, wow, these are, and I think they were, uh, you know, standard Tomastic or something. I said, mm -hmm. my God, I used to play these. I couldn't believe how thin they were. And, but they, you know, I have to say they sounded nice on that bass that, but I, it was a, it's a, it's all a touch thing for me. And I think that's why I kind of gave up using a pickup because it affected my right hand touch. I, yeah, you know, I didn't have to dig in the amp, the amp did everything. The pickup did everything. Mm -hmm. And, um, uh, I like, I like having that control of dynamics. That's all on me. And, uh, um, but you know, there's times where I've played where you know, wow, where did that blister come from on my right hand? You know, like, <laughs> and uh, so, um, but yeah, if I could just learn not to mess with it, I, I, I uh, but I have to, you know, I was coming back from Cape Cod and the suitcase, the wheel of the suitcase went into my base Ooh. and put put a, a hole on the side and on one of the ribs. And it doesn't affect the sound, but I got a hole in the bass. You know? Oh yeah, so, yeah. So I'm getting that. I'm getting that repaired uh, by Bill uh, in November, and and I remember thinking, oh god, I got to get the top uh, the top taken off, and uh, and it's just sounding, you know, in the fall now. Every there's there's no wintertime German bass buzz, you know. Yep, <laughs> yep. <laughs> it's it's. Uh, 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 it's it's just perfect now, and I, I hate to, uh, but you know you might be able to help me with something. I'm uh, an unrelated bass playing thing. You know my my tuners. I have um, you know they're the standard heart shape tuners, but uh, one side I had to replace them years ago because they they stopped working, and they're just they're, the four of them. This, there's not a matching set, and they don't really work well. So mm -hmm. I was going to replace them. And Bill had these 18th century hat peg tuners. Ooh, cool! And the oh, the, the the actual gears are beautiful, and and the uh, the the grips are oh, they just I I love them. You know, I just but we couldn't. But it, it's not my base is what 1950, 1940. So it's definitely you know could devalue the base, but. I don't care. No. There's just they, you know. Uh, I don't think that's going to make a difference. Somebody buying this base someday, uh, and but I look so, but we couldn't find the pegs. Oh. That was the problem. We've been searching there. You know, I went to. Uh, um, he had some. I think Upton in Germany uh, uh -huh. was his connections, and they they could sell them with tuners with the tuning gears, but nobody had the individual ones that, that he would have to shape or whatever, uh, uh, and, and put with these old tuners. So, you know, I located two, but I've, 
you know, somebody mentioned the international violin, mm -hmm. um, uh, all these different places. Um, no luck finding uh, ebony, the ebony pegs for uh, uh, the head peg tuners. And so wow. uh, if I can't get them, uh, I have to go in November to get that, that hole fixed. I'm just saying, all right, I'm just going to go with the um, uh, hopefully a rounded, rounded grips which i like um with this base it's it's age appropriate i guess mm -hmm. but but those other tuners that he had uh um uh, they just they they felt so good and, and uh so but i might uh, i think they made the base i think the hat pegs make the base a little lighter uh um, oh sure yeah 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 and and um, so, uh, and just more wood. I just, you know, more wood, less brass or metal. I, I, I just like the thought of that. Uh, yeah. I'm not sure I could find them in time. And I'm, but I've been, been over about 18 months. I've been looking for, uh, um, and he's been looking. We, we, we haven't been able to find it. Well, if anybody, so, uh, if I, 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 I don't, I don't, I don't have them sitting behind here in my in my studio. Yeah. But if if anybody listening, I know a lot of luthiers and folks listen. So yeah. uh, let yeah. let Don know. Yeah, <laughs> yeah no, I like I, I've I've used these. I've got a more modern base, tw uh, 20, 30 years old, and it's it, I've got the the. Um, where those Sloan tuners you see on all sorts of modern bases and they're good. People think they're, people think they're overbuilt and they are kind of a heavy uh, contraptions, but they've been, they've been issue free for me. And it's funny, you know, the tinkering and the moving the bridge and the up and down, you are definitely not the only person. <laughs> I think everybody out there, uh, is, you know, just wants to find that certain spot to get dial it in. I had a former uh, a colleague back in Chicago. He was constantly adjusting his bridge and like moving it back and forth. And, the old principal base of Chicago Symphony, actually Joe Guastafesti, he was famous for. He would like bang his bridge around on the base like d regularly during during rehearsals that's, and that's, stuff. That's me. That's me. I, I used to have a. <laughs> my daughter gave me like this, like it was a rock that said "Number One Dead" or something, and I banged the tuner, like the the uh, uh, the uh, adjusters, mm -hmm. uh, so often that I I, I I've taken off worlds number one dance, you know, <laughs> the line. and and i was one day i remember bringing it and said, why do you got all this like blue paint on the adjusters <laughs> and i had to admit what i've done you know to, uh you know so yeah, so it's not just me. Thank it's God. it's definitely not just you. I mean, I was even in our in our local middle school uh, last week, uh, got, working with some of these you know seventh graders, and something was buzzing. So I was showing them all the sort of like bizarre ways you can stop a bass buzz. Uh, so we're all we're all tinkering. <laughs> yeah, yeah, me too. Me too. Well, you know, it's funny moving to a modern or more modern bass. I had this old, great old German bass that played great from 1880 or something like that, but it had a buzz and there was a different buzz for every season and it would drive me bananas. And, and the, one of my, my favorite things about getting this jack stat, it was like buzz free. And I was like, Oh, so I, I became a little bit less of a tinkerer once I, once I got this jack stat. But it's amazing, you know, if like Sunday was a rainy day out here and I just said, OK, I know exactly. And of course, as soon as I pick it up in the morning, it's like having a bad knee or something. You know, it, <laughs> it, it made this sound. And and, I, you know, of course, I think I know where it is, you know, after all these years and I do my magic and this and that. And nah, it, it's it'll go away just just enough to like. Uh, fake me out, and then a couple minutes later, it, we'll be uh, back. <laughs> we'll be back. And, uh... Well, this is good. this is good therapy for everybody out there who's like struggling with their bass. But yeah, I, I had a, I was having a conversation with somebody here in San Francisco, bass player and uh, luthier also named Rob Ashley, and he was saying he was making the analogy that the the type of instruments we play, like these nice instruments, they're kind of like uh, high end sports cars, you know, and they always are requiring some maintenance. Like they go, they work really well, but they always need something, you know, to be done to them. And I would say mine's definitely middle of the road. You know, it's, it's, it's not an early Juzak. It's a three quarters. Uh, it used to be belong to a school, mm -hmm. uh, uh, um, Madison Avenue, New York in the, in the fifties. And, uh, and they, how I know that because they carved 
right in the scroll there. I mean, in the inlay on the back below the neck, they carved the phone number of the school <laughs> and the address and had base number one. <laughs> so, uh, um, uh, but, you know, remarkable that they even have an instrument uh, fairly good in the school system. And so this, this is like a workhorse, you know, yeah. it, it's, um, it's a little bit tight to play, but I, I like that uh, uh, with, um, with the gut strings. Uh, it, it, it bothered me when I was using metal strings, uh, but with the, the gut strings, it it, um, it 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 keeps them. Um, it doesn't make them loose and floppy, which I don't like. Mm -hmm. So it 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 keeps them tight, and uh, and I found I found that the higher I raise the uh, the adjusters, the easier it is to play. Uh, it it gets it. I guess because more sound comes out, I don't have to play as hard. Mm. But I found as I'm getting older. There's definitely, you know, it, it, you're not 20 years old the way you could move around on a base. Uh, uh, um, so, but I guess less is more is is really uh, uh, um, it's really part of what my I'm tr uh, my thinking these days. What I'm trying to hear and uh, um, and trying to improvise. Uh, yeah. But uh, you know, like I said, without using my the situations like I session at my home, maybe three or four times a week, I have guitar players, piano players, and drummers, horn players that will come here uh, uh, at least two to three times, maybe a little more, and I'll go somewhere else. But the gigs have definitely diminished, uh, uh, maybe because, you know, I don't want to drive three hours anymore. Right. I don't want to, uh, um, you know, that was at one point exciting, uh, uh, you know, dr driving upstate New York or driving, um, and then all the musicians I play with, we all kind of moved so far away from each other, you know, just to do a session with this pianist who I've played with uh, since 2009. She's 130 miles away, and I would leave like six in the morning, get there and, you know, get home uh, in that evening. So um, all of a sudden, uh, that's not as attractive as it, as it once was. You know? With Upton Bass, there is a lot of dialogue back and forth between Upton and the person they're designing the base for. Here's Gary and Eric on that topic. By the time I'm taking an order, we may have a dozen emails. We got a couple phone calls back and forth. I mean, it, it is extremely rare that the phone rings, hey, first time caller, uh, here's my credit card. Yeah, yeah. We've got a relationship. Oh, yeah. Hours and hours you know? and hours. Right. So Gary right. and I have like, we've listened to you enough that we've, within your budget, We've gotten you into the right base the first time. Listening is what it's all about, and that's what Gary and Eric and everybody at Upton excel in so spectacularly. Learn more at UptonBase.com, and thanks so much for sponsoring the podcast. Samuel Colstein, who founded Colstein and Sons back 70 years ago at this point, Sam was largely self-taught. Here's Barry Colstein about how his father got into the business. You know, it was mainly self-taught, yeah. but but he I will pay homage to people that need to be paid homage. He did study a bit with Al Eisenstein, who was a great repairman in Manhattan. He was considered one of the top. And Al was very gracious. He allowed my father to sit at his side, watch him work. But a lot of it was self-taught. My father was very ing ingenious person. He really would look at a problem and figure out five ways of, of doing it and then choose the right way always. Ever since those early years, Colstein and Sons has been working to solve problems for bass players, provide them with ever better instruments and new opportunities in terms of travel bases and cases and all sorts of things that we need as bass players. Thank you, Barry, and thank you, Colstein, for everything that you do and for sponsoring the podcast. There is this mode in my practicing app, Modacity, which I totally love. It's called Deliberate Practice, and it's such a cool feature. Here's Modacity. Founder and CEO Mark Gelfo on how this works. One of my pain points as a musician was like not really having a method to generate reliable improvement. And deliberate practice is like the scientific method for music practice. So what you do is you identify the one thing that you want to improve, be it articulation, intonation, emotion, comfort, whatever it is you want to improve, and brainstorm or choose one of the pre-suggested strategies for that area of improvement and then test it out. Record yourself trying that strategy, listen back and press yes 
it worked or no, it didn't work to create that improvement. It's such a clean way of tracking your progress. I do it every day and it has done wonders for my bass playing and just my overall enthusiasm for music. You got to check it out. Modacity.co is the site. And if you go to our site, you can click through it and get a special offer for lifetime access for this app. Thank you so much for sponsoring the podcast, Modacity. This episode is brought to you by Encoda. By the way, that's spelled N-K-O-D-A. This app is like Netflix or Spotify for sheet music, and they are working with over a hundred of the major publishers like Boozy and Hawks, Baron Writer, and more to provide sheet music on your device. I have an iPad Pro, but this also works on Android, and I have so many pieces from Encoda loaded up on it. I have all the Beethoven symphonies and their scores. I'm circling things. I'm flipping between the score and the part to show students. I totally love this app, and people like Sir Simon Rattle are singing its praises. It really is the next thing for musicians. It's a subscription service, and you can download Encoda from your app store today for a free trial. That's N-K-O-D-A. And thanks for sponsoring the podcast. Uh, oh, yeah, I, I know. For I, Yeah, for sure. I, when, when I moved out here to San Francisco, I decided one thing I didn't want to do was drive so much because um, I'd been doing, you know, like many musicians, I think I, think I was hitting almost 50,000 miles a year at one point, you know, driving all over the place and finding parking in Chicago and this and that. And, you know, um, so, so my work changed a lot too. And I think, and then even just like, you know, like, like I was talking about earlier, walking around here, North beach, and there's, there's one place kind of for jazz, not even really, uh, you know, down 50%, there were two last year and go back 10 years, there were 12. So, um, yeah, it's just, uh, yeah, the, the culture changes, the work changes. Um, but it's, uh, yeah, but and it's interesting. It's always interesting to me how musicians adjust to the times or reinvent themselves or how this younger generation of players is is coming up. I've been really fascinated by there's this whole group of of uh, musicians kind of around the same age, kind of, you know, in uh, Los Angeles um, that that they all plan each other's albums Um I chat. I had, uh, and of course, I'm kind of blanking on the name of the bass player I was chatting with. From this, um, it'll come to me. But he, he's, uh, you know, they, they've all been really intentional about not just being side people, you know, like like playing each other's gigs, but building their own solo careers, getting into composing, getting into other aspects of the music business, and it's just. See, important for everybody, but especially I think for people that are kind of with a jazz focus. Right. Right. And, and doing records now, that is, that, you know, there's a funny story, uh, 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 a guitarist who I, I, I played with for years, who just passed away, uh, Peter Prisco, mm -hmm. a great teacher, great jazz guitarist. He had a duet uh, job in the village with bassist Bill Crow. Mm -hmm. And uh, so he said to me, he says, you know, I, I got home from the job and I realized after parking and this and that, I lost all this money. <laughs> And I called I called Bill up and I said, Bill, I can't afford to do these jobs anymore. Yeah. And I think he quoted a Lester Young line and he said, oh, Peter, don't you know you got to save up for these gigs? <laughs> and uh, so, uh, uh, but uh, yeah, there's uh, but with records now, it's almost the same way. You have to uh, uh, record labels aren't. It's it's not like at one time where there was an AR person or if you sent something, somebody who had some real credibility would listen to it and, mm -hmm. and decide or, um, or a record label would take you. Uh, so it seems like everybody is self-producing and then trying to sell to a label. And if the label takes you, they got, they recoup their expenses and then, then you might get, you know, your uh, $1 split three ways for <laughs> sales or, um, yeah, it's the whole thing has just changed. And now that everybody can record their own record or do it themselves, uh, and just stream it, uh, there's, um, there's just a whole lot of stuff out there. It's maybe just too much for anybody to, to find, to find anything, you know, it's like with books, everybody's self-producing books on Amazon or something. So how do you determine, uh, how do you find another really good novel or another if there's just so many uh, if it doesn't get good reviews or if it doesn't get reviewed um and now you even got to pay to pay to be considered to be reviewed uh on, on, on a lot of the magazines 
yeah, it's 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 crazy. Yeah, it used to it used to be you just go down to your local, you go to go to Birdland or whatever, and that that's what was happening is what was right there. Now it's like this sort of yeah, the the, the challenge of our times, right? This this I- I- embarrassment of riches in a way, or you know the and and you know in a some some positives for sure. Like I found all these, you know, especially with what I do, I found all these bass artists I never would have you know, encounter these young people in the UK or Australia that are kind of pushing the envelope. Um, but yeah, it's, uh, it, 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 it's a far cry from like the, the CD era, you know, like the early nineties and that, 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 uh, yeah. Well, you know, one of the things that, that I'm thrilled that in a way that I, uh, there's a lot of reasons why I'm thrilled to be involved with Lenny's music and all the musicians and one way associated with him and I have to think of Sal Mosca in the same uh, uh, um, kind of category of the two of them, is that before I met them, when I, would, um, when I would play with people, it would always be, you know, you would get together and rehearse for a gig. Mm-hmm. So, you know, someone said, you want to get together? And so we got a gig, we would rehearse. But with Lenny's thing and all these students, the sessioning among players was as important as your daily practicing. Mm. You know, there was there was always one guy who had a, had a house. You know, we could all go session, and we would work on a tune, or we and there would be a lot of people listening or other players waiting to play. And I remember I remember one time we played some bird tune, and somebody played a different ending, and and afterwards it was everybody everybody went wait a second wait a second is that the right ending you know it, <laughs> or every but it was all these people learning together and and uh the sessions were uh were essential for growing and and it it the way I, the way i went home and practiced with the metronome uh either on two and four or on all four or whatever that's what it was like going to these sessions and there was players at various levels you know there some were definitely more advanced but everybody was playing together uh we would work on a lot of tunes we would uh, we would, uh, you know, somebody would say, well, you know, I just learned this uh, Charlie Christian solo. Uh, you mind if we play? I, I can't give you anything but love. I want to try it. And we would do it. Or if somebody learned a uh, Fats Navarro solo on, out of nowhere, you know, we would play it and this guy would work on his solo or maybe a, a, a horn player and, and, an, uh, and an alto player would play it together or somebody would come up with a harmony to it. And they would do it right at these at these sessions, and it it was fantastic. And we were stretched with temples, uh, you know, improvising together. Uh, uh, mm-hmm. So this was a, a major part of uh, of of the year studying, and it's still so. Most of all these players that I, you know, pretty much all the players that I've met and still play with were people that I met while I was studying with Fred Amon, and or I knew of. Uh, uh, and you know the oldest is 92, Ted Brown, and uh, and there's some young guys in their early 20s, uh, guitar players, um, and uh, who are very very good. And uh, you know they all have regular jobs. You know none of them are pursuing music, uh, have never even thought about pursuing music as a career. Where when I was doing, everybody tried it, and then, you, know, <laughs> of, you know we all fell into other things. So we had families, whatever. But yeah. but. You know, I would I would get up. I I eventually became like a an editor, or uh, I worked for a technical uh, engineering company, the IEEE, and worked in their standards department of all you know perfect name, and I um uh, I did that for like twenty something years and got into you know uh, typesetting and and coding and but I would get up hours before I went to work. I made sure that I got my two hours in practicing before I went to work, so. No matter what they tried to do to me, how bad they were going to make me feel working, I would come home and I got my two hours done, you know, and and I would get another hour in the evening. Wow. And um, yeah, so that was, you know, I, I, you know, I had my two daughters when I was studying and uh, so I, you know, I got this job and I remember I went to the HR department when I started and I said, 20 years, I'm out of here. He said, yeah, everybody says that. (laughs) And then uh, this guy was a lot younger than me. And I think I started when I was 40. I did that. And when I retired, he was still there. And he says, you're the talk of the town, 20 and out, you know, you're a, <laughs> it's, it's the Messina plan. But I, I, you know, I did this 
I made it, you know, some people don't tell them that you're, that you're a musician. I made it very clear. I'm a double basses. I'm a jazz player. That comes first. I'll give you, you want your 40 hours, 50 hours, whatever. But don't ask me to travel. Don't ask me this. Um, um, I'll give you all this. And, um, you know, you know, it didn't go over so well at times, but, uh, um, but I, I, I wanted that. I, 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 you know, I needed to, uh, you know, put my kids to college and this and that. And, but I kept the music going. I made sure early in the morning and, uh, my kids still think they hear the bass wherever they're living that the, someone's playing the bass four o'clock in the morning underneath <laughs> them. Uh, they, they, they swear they hear it. And, uh, <laughs> wow. So I, I, I have to ask people will be yelling at me if I don't ask. So it's like, like, cause there are a lot of people out there that are trying to do or, or making it work or, or attempting to fit bass into their lives and they do other things. And maybe they picked up bass later in life or whatever, or they're coming back to it. And so I just love that image of you at four in the morning, like two hours on the bass. So I got to ask like, so what did you do in those hours? Like, what were those two hours like for you? What'd you do that hour in the oh, evening yeah. when you got that oh, in? You know, yeah. One of the greatest things Sal Mosca ever said to me, he said, when you have a job and, you know, he taught, he had, Sal might have had 40 or 50 students in a week, you know, uh, intense. And he, you know, I remember him saying to me, he was not going to be a starving jazz musician. You know, he was going to, he was going to be, a, he was going to do it on his terms. And, and he had a family and the whole bit. And, uh, but he said to me, when you, when you have a job, learn the value and he said it in different ways to other people but the way it was uh kind of said it to me learn the value of 15 minutes of five minutes you mm -hmm. know it, mm -hmm. the important like what you practice you know i i would i i i knew my time was limited in the morning so i was you know i was one of these people where i i i had the things i was working on you know i i, I made sure there were certain things i wanted to get done you know um, I wanted to get my scales done uh, one like a one day, you know. Um, I might have had a. I had. I still do, and I still follow this. Like every Monday is my day where I just play lines. Where I'll put the metronome on, and I'll play like like I'll play some thing themes written by over standards by Charlie Parker. Like uh, like I'll play uh, uh, anthropology, or I'll play. Uh, uh, Lenny Tristano's uh, Leave Me or uh, um, Lester Young's Tickle Toe. Uh, so I have about 40 or 50 of these lines. And every Monday is my, my and I did that 40 years ago. I would put the metro on, I would put the mute on the bass or put some towels on the bridge. Yes. And, uh, uh, and I, would, I, I, I would do that, you know, and, I, and when I went to work, I felt so good. I got this, you know, uh, uh, you know, and the whole, it wasn't, it wasn't a corp, like a corporate thing. It was all these engineers, you know, uh, writing standards from, uh, you know, the IEEE is a real famous organization of engineers, uh, uh, all wireless technology, 802 comes out of them, mm -hmm. uh, the National Electric Safety Code, you know, the NESC, so all these things. So uh, uh, it was kind of a very cool place to play because there was a lot of other musicians who were there, lifers, you know, who, who were classical players and, you know, had to make a living and this and that. So it was, some of the people were very, uh, there was, there was a lot of creativity, but I would go there and I would feel so good that, I, you know, I worked on, uh, worked on my tunes. Uh, I always attempted the Bach cello suites, you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, I still can't get past the third, <laughs> but I, 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 I try to play, uh, some invention like Pablo Casals, right? You got to play Bach every day. And uh, I would work on the inventions. You know, I got maybe eight of them. I play both parts. Uh, um, uh, I would do that. Uh, uh, air training. Air training was an essential thing with uh, studying. So I would I would put on the headphones and uh, sing to Lester Young or to Billie Holiday, try to sing along with her. Uh, um, definitely Charlie Parker. Uh, so I would work on pretty much, you know, everything, but sometimes I didn't have the full, um, uh, before then, like I started this particular job when I was 40, before then, like I took the kind of the dumbest jobs intentionally, kind of like <laughs> thumbing my nose at the, you know, I was a janitor. Mm -hmm. I, uh, I, uh, um, uh, I, I, I did, um, I, 
I put in sprinkler systems. You know, I uh, uh, I I was even at cesspools. You know, wow. like, uh, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. With a guy who his his truck said he was the Abraham Lincoln <laughs> of uh, cesspools or something. I, I didn't quite quite got that, but it was very. But uh, so I had all these like horrible jobs, but they were like early in the morning. I would get up, uh, I would be back by either mid afternoon. And then at those, you know, for about 15 years, I would practice like, you know, five to eight hours a day. Uh, uh, and then finally, when we had the kids and we wanted to buy a house and, you know, uh, uh, the $75 playing jobs, even if they were seven days a week, you know, yeah. wasn't, really, wasn't really adding up uh, uh, to anything. And, um, uh, so, uh, but yeah, I, I, you know, I, you know, like some, the few students that I have now are all guys who they're take their, the base is coming to them in their fifties mm -hmm. and later. So they have real, you know, they never put in the eight hours a day when they were young. Uh, they, and some, a couple of these guys are like, one guy had a base in a box came to me. Oh. He said, all right, I bought this from China. I don't even know what to do with it. So this guy, five years later, is still with me. And, but he, I can't give him, like, you know, after five years of studying, he's, I'm trying to figure out what will make it fun for him mm -hmm. as well as what's going to, so I have to approach that differently. So there are people that later on, um, uh, you know, later on in life, uh, this, this instrument interests them. But I can't make it as intense as it was. Uh, um, but I was always able to separate the two. I, I, I just love playing. I, 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 I love playing a bass line. I, uh, um, I, I, I just love it so much that, um, you know, I, I didn't care what I did to make money. You know, I, yeah. I, 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 I tried, you know, after I retired at 60, I really thought, oh, God, you know, what the world really needs is another – you know, they want me. <laughs> you know, so I really thought, you know, I had all these great musician friends and, and I, I was going to put bands together and, we were, you know, and, you know, I was the one who I was going to go out and get these college jobs. I was going to get this. And I had some success for a while, but, you know, uh, it, it, you know, driving up, driving eight hours, driving five hours, you know, flying out to this place or that place uh, a few times. And, and, you know, I said, you never got called back. You know, you would play a place, you would sell it out. They never call you back. Right. You, you know, you would you would start over again or uh, uh, or the person who was booking it last week is a new person this week. Or, you know, why didn't you call last week? You call <laughs> next week. You know, the same <laughs> right. stuff. And yeah, that we all go through it. And But I just found, I just remember, like I said, the, the beauty of these sessions and especially I had from uh, the year 2000 uh, to 2007, going up to Sal Moscow's once or twice a week, uh, mm -hmm. the session with him, and we would have drums. Uh, it started off as a as a quartet or a trio, and then he had a lot a lot of his students, and there were, there would be a lot of players. But I remember one afternoon we're playing. And it was summertime, and it was really hot out, and, and we. I remember we played Cherokee and. Um, it was, you know, Sal could stretch out like, uh, oh, you know, it, it, totally original. Everything, every time he touched the piano, it was so original, but it was steeped with such history. You know, it was always yeah. Tatum and Powell. And, but he could, his harm, he, harmonically, I could follow him. I eventually, after that many years playing with him and listening to him, I could follow, but rhythmically, he could, I could get thrown. If I wasn't counting to myself, I could get thrown in a second, you know. But I remember going up there and the challenge was so great. It, it, but it was, you know, at times it was daunting that uh, how scary it was. But it was, you know, you wanted this challenge. And I remember him saying after we played, what's better than this? What, what is better? What could we, any of us be doing? that's better than this. Mm -hmm. And Sal was about 77, 78 at the time when I remember him saying that. And all of his years, you know, playing with Charlie Parker, playing at Birdland, you know, playing, uh, making records with Lee Konitz. Uh, um, you know, he was, he was the piano player for Lenny Bruce when Lenny Bruce was in New York. Wow. And then Peter Edge, 
for the opening act, you know, and he has stories about them, you know, uh, uh, just incredible uh, uh, playing in playing in Provincetown, uh, Massachusetts, and Billy Holiday comes in and sits in with him and Lee Konitz, uh, <laughs> oh, or or um, um, just all these great things. But even with all that, he said, "Is there anything better than just us for playing in this room? No." You know, a good piano. Um, we're not worried about the money. Did we bring in enough people? Uh, it's just pure improvising and and pure music. And and that was the approach that I've taken all these years. And um, and most of all the players that I'm associated with have that similar. You know, some have some have, some have had uh, degrees of uh, um, uh, success, and others. Uh, um, are not as well known. And, you know, if I would love to mention there's this basis from uh, Yonkers named Lou Stelludi, mm -hmm. who was a student of Lenny Tristano's, who, who is just a fantastic, fantastic player. Uh, one of the best. And, you know, I think he's on a couple records. Uh, we've done some duets, you know, we're friendly. He played with all the people that, uh, you know, uh, he was, he used to play with my teacher and and all the guys that I, I that I eventually ended up playing with. Louis was uh, was one of the bass players with them and Lenny Tristano and Sal and Warren Marsh and Lee Konitz way back and uh, great. You know he's he's in Mount Vernon. Great great player. So uh, you know there's guys like that that are just doing it and nobody knows of them uh, or or the people that do really do know. But um, so it's been it's been a beautiful association with all these people. It, it's it's um, you know it's hard uh, uh, it's hard music, uh, but that I, I love that you know, yeah. I love that challenge and uh, um, and it's still basically you know we're still basically you know the thing that's funny we're still kind of. Um, playing the same tunes, uh, the same standards. <laughs> but what keeps it interesting, a lot of us always write new lines over it. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, all the things you are, you know, uh, Sal Mosca has lines. I have my own line. You know, Lenny Tristano had some, Lee Konitz, Warren Marsh. And they really make uh, the tune, you know, you come up with some alternate changes for it. Like Sonny Dallas, uh, who I met, who was Lenny's bass player, um, remember telling me on the phone one time that, uh, uh, that as a bass player, just improvise the harmony. You know, come up with, you know, if, if you know, out of nowhere, you know, that G major for two bars, he said, uh, you know, put, figure out another chord in mm. between there to go to the, uh, the B minor, you know. Uh, and he would just say, you should be improvising, you should be working with the pianist as you're improvising, you know, you know, leading, leading the way, at, yeah. as and that had that had an effect on, on me. And uh, um, and I, when I listen to Sonny, uh, the records he has, uh, he does that. And um, and uh, so he was great. And another guy that not people don't know of, but he, I think he's uh, Vinny. You know, Vinny Burke. I've I, I've heard the name. I don't I don't I'm not familiar. Yeah. I don't think that. So, yeah. Vinny, Vinny was from Newark, New Jersey. Mm -hmm. He was a guitar player, and he hurt during the war and working in a factory or something. He hurt his hand. He switched to bass. And there's all these uh, videos, like Art Ford Jazz uh, uh, Jazz Party that's on YouTube. And it's him playing with Lester Young, with Billy Holiday, with Roy Eldridge, Coleman Hawkins, wow. uh, Tal Farlow, Lee Konitz, uh, uh, Eddie Costa. Uh, he played a five-string bass way back. Mm. And he had this. He, there's a record. There's some records with Tal Farlow um, that are. Uh, there, the one called the swinging guitar of Tal Farlow. I think it's on Verb. The sound that this guy gets on the bass, it's you know how like when you pluck a cello like uh, the, the the high string, he was able to get that sound on the bass. He had this. And we would do duets, you know, we, he was my best friend from high school uncle. You know, when I got into jazz, he's, you know, I remember he said, let's go visit my uncle. <laughs> and he, and here's this guy with real to real tapes of him with everybody. And he had this unique melodic line and bass line. I've still never heard 
anybody else get the sound that he got. And he, um, there's one record out, it was an LP, now CD, on um, Bethlehem. One side uh, of the LP was uh, Oscar Pettiford. The other side was Vinnie Burke. Mm. So uh, um, uh, and so he 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 was he was like the house bass player in Jersey for a lot of places, but he's another guy unique, really had his own sound. Uh, a lot of people don't know about him, but but a fantastic. You know, I was lucky lucky enough to meet him and do duets with him, and uh, uh, um, definitely a major him Oscar major influence on me, and uh, uh, so there was all these wow. great guys that I met through the association, through Sal and Lenny. And uh, uh, it, it's really it, very lucky, very yeah. lucky uh, uh, to have uh, been and still be part of it in some way. This episode is brought to you by Steve Swan String Bass. And Steve has been researching top re-graduation for many years. Here's Steve on the topic. I found some old uh, diagram bass tops in an old violin making book that had violins, violas, cellos, and only four basses from kind of the classic period, the early 1800s. And I took a pattern of uh, kind of a topographical map of thicker in the center under the bridge, and then, you know, the thinnest is right near the edges, you know, just before it flares out and gets strong again. And I put in some measurements that I thought would work, and we use that as a general pattern for top graduation, and it really works. You would be amazed how well this technique works. I've been impressed time and time again at how immediately a bass speaks after coming from Steve's shop and how resonant and beautiful and open the sound is. Learn more at steveswanstringbass.com and thanks for sponsoring the podcast, Steve. Hey, Jason. How are you? Hope you're well. Um, thank you for asking me about... The, the Dario strings, and what do I like about the Dario strings? Um, well, I've been using them for about six or seven years. Um, I use the Zyx medium set. Um, what I like about it is that, for me, it has provided a sort of like a really good compromise. I like the, the, the feel under my fingers is great because it's sort of like a gutty feel. The strings are thicker than general, uh, generally metal strings are. And I used to play with like an olive G before and spiracore. So it kind of like recreates that feel. And it's their strings are loose. They're not super tight, like definitely a lot less tight than any of the Dario um, metal uh, steel strings. Um, and I really like that part about it, that it just like I kind of feel like the synthetic core strings have like this um, gutty kind of feel. Um, then they have a depth to them that I really like. At the same time, they have also a nice um, attack, especially for pizzicato, jazz pizzicato, which is what I do mostly. And at the same time, they also bow really well. My bow sticks to them greatly. Um, I do have to wash, clean the, the strings a few times if I'm bowing, because I like to cake my bow with quite a lot of rosin. Um, but overall, um, they're just a great uh, sort of like um, catch-all string for me. Um, I would say the only thing that it's perhaps not as great about them is that every six months uh, I feel like they start going out of tune and then I think that I'm playing out of tune and what's wrong with me? And it's like, oh, the strings must be wearing out. And then I uh, change them and then they're great again with the new set. Uh, so that's all. Love those Zyx strings. And I'm very, very happy to be the Dario artist. They're great people and um, very lucky about it. Thank you so much, Jason. Take care. This episode is brought to you by the Bass Violin Shop, which opened in 2001 as a small double bass workshop in Greensboro, North Carolina. Today, they're staffed by three full-time, highly skilled bass luthiers, and they specialize in double bass sales, rentals, setup, restoration, and repair. For nearly 20 years, they have satisfied thousands of clients by offering quality instruments, knowledgeable service, reliable repairs, and superior restorations at affordable prices. They offer high-quality, 
custom ebony C extensions with two different chromatic latch options. Handmade ebony latches with adjustable aluminum mounts by New Harmony Music or adjustable brass latches by Rob Anzalotti. Give the bass violin shop a call to discuss your extension needs. For more information and current inventory, visit their website at bassviolinshop.com and be sure to follow them on Facebook and Instagram. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's fascinating. You, you know, you're talking about the, you know, playing the, playing the same tunes and, you know, sort of the endless variations on that. And I remember chatting with, uh, Chuck Israels. I don't, I, I, I had, I had him on the podcast. I don't remember if we talked about this on the podcast, but he was talking about how, uh, and I think we all kind of know this, but, but there, you know, there was this moment in when jazz, like when popular music and this like amazing repertoire that we're still playing, were we're both popular, you know, and, and, and people like Billie Holiday and just all those people that we were talking about earlier. And it's just funny that, you know, that, that era is such a special era that, that all these standards have come from and that, you know, and, and I, I guess maybe that era is gone for good, <laughs> but, but, you know, uh, Ch Chuck was, he was, he was, uh, sort of, uh, you know, he was not optimistic about, uh, where popular music was headed or had been headed ever since then. But, but I mean, I, I like all sorts of things. I like things that are being written right now too, but I do think it's interesting that there was this, the, the, that special era of the fifth, especially the fifties, maybe forties into the sixties, but I don't know what, I don't know what it was, but, um, you know, we're all still sort of, you know, remembering that. You know, if it was post the, the whole post war thing, I mean literature yeah. too. Mm -hmm. for a, yep. and, and uh the the some of the uh painters that came out as well and the poets. Yeah. There was something was happening uh 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 in this country that was intense, you know, uh, uh and yeah, it's hard. It's it's um um you know, I don't I don't know if technology or, or what has what has changed it, uh uh you know, I, I watched last night. I, I uh, since my Yankees are my Yankees have been uh, uh, dis, uh, demoralized, uh, uh, right. so I couldn't. There was no ball game on for me to watch. So I I watched this special called the Jazz Loft, um, oh. the Jazz Loft Project, and it's about this this photographer. Uh, was it uh, Gene um, Gene Smith, who was like a photographer during World War II and Life magazine and. He had he lived in this building with uh, with with all this jazz going on above him, and he he just took pictures of it all, and he started taping it all. But it became a place for all these, you know, Monk was going there, wow. uh, Phil Woods, uh, um, I believe Bill Crow's, uh, Chuck is interviewed, Chuck Israel was interviewed in this, all these, and but it was this scene where all these guys they said. Here we have all these musicians, and once they found out that there was a place where they could all just go and play, <laughs> they were like there would be a line. It was it was a really good it was a really good documentary. Wow, the, the Jazz Loft. I watched that on Netflix. Oh, okay. And, I, I just wrote yeah. that down. I'm going to check that yeah. out. That sounds fascinating. Yeah. yeah, either wait Netflix or was it Prime? I, it could be either Prime or Netflix. Okay, I'll hunt it. I'll hunt it down. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. And but it was just here are these guys who are like. You know, well known. You know, uh, uh, David Amram. Uh, I think French Horn. Uh, I I forgot who. There was all these composers, uh, uh, modern music composers of that time. And uh, uh, this is like uh, before free music, because they were saying that's when it kind of changed. When there was this, when the music got free, um, there it kind of there was a division among the players, you mm -hmm. know, and, and the loft kind of scene kind of ended in, for this particular thing. But the fact that at two in the morning to two, it was like two in the morning to like 6 a.m. or 7 a.m., these musicians said, hey, there's a place where we could play. Wow. And they all went there. And there was something about that uh, uh, that I'm thinking, well, that thing that they were looking looking for it's like, well, that's that's always been part of my scene, you know, that mm -hmm. we've always had these sessions. And, but maybe that's because I wasn't a, a working professional musician in that regard, where to be able to go somewhere where you didn't have to uh, uh, 
Um, you know, where to me, sometimes I might think, well, wouldn't it be nice if I actually could work seven days a week? Where these guys are saying, boy, how nice it is for us to just go somewhere where we weren't working and performing, we yeah. were just playing. Yeah. So I always had the playing part. I just never, <laughs> never really had, uh, you know, a, uh, you know, there was, there's been gigs, there's, you know, over the years, there's been some great gigs, but it's never, I never had, I was, I never had one of those, like, uh, you know, somebody playing at the, the Village Vanguard, the Half Note, uh, uh, for weeks, you know, mm -hmm. or six nights. Uh, uh, um, so I never had that, but I've always had the sessions. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, you were talking earlier about like the, the $75 uh, a night gig, you know, that, and it's so funny how that, that amount hasn't changed like since the eighties, you know, it's, it's true. And like, I've, I've been out playing bass for a few decades now and like it, the same, the same like crappy gig pays the same as it did when I was in college, you know? So, it... <laughs> so I got to ask you, so how did you, how did you start your, uh, your website, your blog? I mean, that uh, I mean, really, when I when I came across it, and the, some of the the classical players, that they're the ones who really like have knocked me out on your site. You know, when you would you I would go and listen to them, and uh, 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 what was it? Um, uh, uh, you know, and it just the 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 just the, the, just the whole scene of bass players that you brought together. I, I just think it's great. I, I, I was totally under, under, like I said in the beginning, unaware of all this happening. And you've kind of brought it all these different uh, types of uh, basis together under this. And, and you know, it, it really, when I go to your site, it feels like a community, you know, like um, I might be in my little narrow world, but I, when I go to your site, I say, I'm part of this base thing, you know, in one way or another. Oh, well, well that's, know, that's, 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 that's great to hear because that, that, that is the intent. <laughs> so I'm yeah, glad. Oh, you, you, I'm glad. you've nailed it. I mean, it's, it's uh, you don't like when I'm listening to something that I like don't quite get or understand. I, there's no, you know, uh, maybe I finally hit that point. There's no, I, I mean, I'm listening to, it and I'm with no, you know, not being judgmental, I'm sitting back and, you know, everybody's uh, trying to be on. I, that's how I got the feeling. I didn't, mm -hmm. I didn't get that anybody's like uh, bullshitting or, or doing, yeah. uh, doing nonsense with you. You know, everybody's, uh, they're, they're being themselves and uh, uh, the, 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 so many, the, 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 yeah, it's just, a, it's a great site. Uh, it, it's, uh, I just, it's amazing that the world has all these places, you know, all these bass players doing it. Yeah. Uh, I, I know. No, it's like, it's like, like most products, totally random, no plan. I, I, I like a, you're asking like, how did, how did I build? Like I, I get, I got about 15 years ago, I decided I was going to quit taking auditions. Like I'd been auditioning for orchestras and I, I think I'd taken almost 30 and I just got fed. I was taking a, I think a St. Louis symphony audition and I left and I was just like, all right, I'm done. So I just, I just found myself with more time on my hands and I started uh goofing around online and one thing led to another and but but my favorite thing I do uh I love doing the podcast because it's fun it's like it's such a great way to carve out time with somebody and just talk about the craft and like we're so we're you know everybody no matter where they are in life is so we all have plenty of projects on our plate and the I, I, even though I think a lot of us, you know, idealistically would think, oh, it'd be great to carve out an hour or two and just chat with different people. Um, you know, it's the podcast is a great way to just sort of have a framework for that. And so I, I would, I would be, I could just lie and say, I didn't have a podcast and I would, I would still get all this enjoyment. Cause it's like, oh, it's, yeah. you know, yeah, it's great to chat with you. Yeah. So that's sort of, it's sort of this. Me, that wasn't know. even recorded today. I would be fine. <laughs> you know, right. I think it's great chat. Yeah. You're well, absolutely the, right. Yeah, the funny thing is I forget there is a podcast because I have people that help. And so uh, for me, the experience is this, just chatting with you right now. And then people and then and then I get these emails from people like, oh, I'm, I'm listening to you in Sydney, Australia, or I was, you know, on a cruise and I was listening or, or my I'm playing this to my students. And I love that part about an hour in. And so it's yeah, it's a it's a fascinating. Uh, so, you know, the, the, the world changes, the culture changes, the gigs dry up, the gigs change. But I do. This is one 
thing that I think is I, I, I'm I'm enjoying uh, this, you know, podcasting. I, I love this long form audio and I listen to them myself when I'm on a run or I'm on a drive or whatever. And so, yeah, it's a lot of fun. And, you know, it's that was the, the one thing of not studying with a basis for me is that I, you know, it was good and bad in, in terms of uh, good where I had I had I had to you know, had to create my own thing. And, you know, I watched a lot of video or, and, or, 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 you know, for my right hand, for hand positioning mm -hmm. and, but I lost, you know, it's, 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 um, for somebody who's not around a lot of basis, it's, and then when I get the opportunity, boy, it's real nice, you know, uh, uh, it, it, it's nice to, like you said, I'm not the only one banging the brick. <laughs> You're <laughs> you know, definitely and, not. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> And, uh, you know, it's like, God, it's like, I, I, I'm embarrassed to say that I'm moving my bridge. It's, when I when I get this work done to it, I'm going to ask Bill to, like, could you varnish that area underneath the bridge? Because I got so many lines where it should be, you know, as that, uh, uh, you know, I, I, you know, he, he would mark it whenever he's done work. This is where your bridge should be. Leave it alone. You know? <laughs> and then when I come back, like, six months or a year later, he'll say, there's all these other lines. Who drew, who drew these lines? That you is know, funny. And, uh, I said, well, you know, I thought maybe you know, this this week it sounded really good here, you know. And uh, well, you and you and Joe Guastafesti would have a good time chatting with it because Joe had this. See, I know, right? Well, yeah, it was like a five hundred thousand dollar base at least, or something, and and it was covered with all these marks because he would just in the middle of rehearsal, he just go like bang on the bridge. And one of the what, this is going back thirty years or something, but one of the Chicago bases, symphony bases that had just joined, it may have been Rob Castinger, I can't remember. He saw Joe doing that, so he thought, oh, "I'll try that." And he banged his bridge and he just like knocked the bridge completely out <laughs> and like fell down. Uh, so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I've definitely learned, like you know, like uh, there's definitely a. Uh, uh, you know, the, the, I've definitely learned how to knock the bridge. And, you know, I might not be, my intonation might be lacking, you know, this and that, you know, but I do know how to knock the bridge, you know, after all these years, like <laughs> my greatest accomplishment, you know. Uh, uh, so uh, I know, um, uh, uh, have you heard uh, Larry's uh, solo record that came out? Um, yeah, I, I have. And I got the chance yeah. in uh, 2017, he did a concert. He was one of the headliners for the International Society of Basis Convention up in Ithaca. And he played a bunch of selections from that and then played with his wife. And I think he is playing solo at SF Jazz this weekend. I, he's definitely playing at SF Jazz. I think it's just Larry. So I'm going to check something. But yeah, I love oh. I love it. It's amazing. Yeah. So yeah, you got to mention James Farber to him. So he'll know. That's my. We grew up together, and that's his. Uh, James and I grew up in, in Springfield, New Jersey, together. And James is the one that records him and Brad Meldow all the time. And uh, cool. uh, and, and yeah, he maybe he'll share. Uh, um, you know, James has never recorded me. He's just always mixed uh, my records. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, why not just can. Because James doesn't have a studio, so like people would, you know, for ECM or Verb or something, would, um, uh, you know, they would do a record and they would hire James, and uh, so um, so I've never had that, but I've had him uh, mix mine, and and but he's just a master. Uh, he he's he just knows, you know, the, the where the room is, where to place the mic, and I know he's done. I think, yeah, what he's done, uh, Dave, Dave Holland's solo record as well. And just beautiful. Uh, uh, he's really been able to capture the bass uh, uh, beautifully. And uh, there's, there's, he's, uh, he's one of these special guys that really, you know, he uses, he uses the technology to make it sound like the way it sounds in the room. And, uh, um, it, it's it, uh, one of these days. I hope I'm able to uh, actually have them re record me. Uh, um, but I'm working. So I started working on my second solo solo project, and I've learned a lot from the first one. And uh, uh, it's it's not easy. But I I do have an I, you know, this time I I think uh, my focus is. Uh, uh, is better with what I want to do, and and I would make it shorter. And um, uh, and again, I think less notes. You know, 
if you know you're playing, you don't feel like you're playing a lot. But then you gotta listen back. Sometimes uh, 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 the bass, um, you know, a lot of notes. You you lose some of those. Uh, uh, you know, when you're playing fast, I I think the bass sometimes you you it gets muddy or you lose you lose the 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 the, the fine detail of your line mm -hmm. uh, sometimes. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, like for me. Like I said, you know, I, I won't go on about Oscar anymore. But <laughs> I, you know, uh, um, you know, there's those. There's a video of uh, of Sonny Rollins with uh, Niels Henning Oscar Peterson. Sure. Uh, from uh, and he's, you know, I think it's he's just using a mic, so it's early '60s. He doesn't have any electronics. He I, looks like he's using gut strings. Oh, it's fantastic, you know, and he's plucking with just one finger. You know, two years later, he's plucking with, uh, you know, five fingers on his right hand. He's using all the fingers on it. You know, I've never heard anybody play the bass, you know, as to me, like as marvelously as him, you know, his skill. Uh, uh, but he went from this acoustic sound from having a pickup on almost, I think, under each, a different pickup under each string or something. Uh, yeah. Uh, and and uh, the ability to, and, you know, change the whole setup I, I watched an interview i think it was on an italian um uh so uh on youtube where, um where he was saying well you know if the advantages of lower action versus higher action the pickup and he showed both ways and i know when he said well this is the, the older way that i had to play and when I heard this oh no no that's <laughs> you know i immediately was attracted <laughs> to this uh um, this particular way of plucking very, you know, it's Sonny Rollins, I, uh, 19, uh, um, I think it's in the Netherlands. It's just fantastic. And he's, he's plucking his right hand is really, it's, it's really worth watching where he's, he's kind of almost grabbing the string from underneath, but pressing down at the same time. Oh, wow. Uh, and, and getting such a sound. And, and it's with Alan Dawson, just a trio, so a cordless group. And he's spectacular. And there's, a, there's also an a early video with him with Bill Evans from 1961, uh, this piano summit from uh, Berlin. It's Bill Evans. It might be Alan Dawson again or uh, Connie Kay. And they're playing Beautiful Love. And he takes this remarkable solo sound and feel of this feeling that he got and and watching this right hand you, you, it, it, it's really and it's like one finger he's just plucking with one finger wow. and still tons of stuff happening and you know and then years later not too long after i, I heard him with uh, the, another recording with sunny where you could definitely tell uh it's it's just so much that i uh I couldn't. I couldn't hear all the notes, and uh, uh, so uh, so yeah. So that's what I'm trying. I'm learning from my first recording, um, especially for a solo bass record, uh, uh, to, to simplify a little more. Mm -hmm. uh, and and, uh, and I do like recording it as if like a. I would love to do a solo performance. That's how I did the first record, which was really hard. But I decided that's how I want to do the second one again, you know. Uh, <laughs> but just yeah, so much for learning from my mistakes. Um, but I want to, I, you know, I want. It's the feeling of going one tune to the next, and uh, I have the tunes that I want. I, you know, I keep changing the order. I, I but I plan on uh, uh, later this year uh, to record it. Uh, and just in my home, you know, I use a DAT recorder and mm -hmm. uh, stereo mic, and I got to get it before the weather changes, before my bass starts making noise. <laughs> you know. Uh... <laughs> well, let, let's. You know, I, I I think of this podcast like the Tonight Show. It's like I like I love having people multiple times. I just I just had uh, Danny Zeman, a bass player, on. I think it was for the seventh time on the podcast. So so um uh, uh, and I knew we there's, there's, we'd have more than enough to chat about. But maybe when you when you're getting that album ready to go, maybe we could do a round two and talk about that and the process. And I would love to chat with James, even if it's only for 15 minutes. I could probably I could probably get more than. 
than 15 minutes out of him. <laughs> but yeah. but. <laughs> well, you know, I, I told him I was doing this today, and he said, "Well, he hopes you have a lot of tape." <laughs> uh, we have, we have, so we I definitely, definitely <laughs> we definitely have plenty yeah, of tape. Yeah. <laughs> well, James and I will we'll have like we'll, we'll call and uh, we'll get into our music things and go on for hours. Don, such a pleasure to chat with you. Folks, you can learn more about Don in the show notes for this episode, and we've got links and all kinds of good stuff like that there. And I just really appreciate you hanging out with me and with Don and listening and hanging out every week as I have these conversations. I learned so much talking to people on this podcast. I've said it many times, but It's a great excuse just to connect with people for me, and I would love to have these conversations even if there was no podcast, but having this platform is just an added benefit. So thank you for listening. Feedback at Contrabass Conversations if you want to reach out to me, and thank you to the team that produces this podcast. Michael Cooper, Steve Hinchy, Trevor Jones, and Mitch Mooring. Check out Mitch's award-winning bases on his website, mitchmooring.com, and thank you to Krista Copper for cataloging and archiving everything we talk about here every week on the podcast. I'm your host, Jason Heath, and we will see you again soon for more life on the low end of the spectrum.